Hello and welcome to Backyard Farmer. I'm Kim Todd. We're glad you could join us for another hour of answering those landscape questions. We'd love to hear from you. If you'd like to submit a question, dial 402-472-1212 if you live in Lincoln. Our toll-free number is 800-676-5446. If you can wait for a future show or you'd like to send us some pictures, email us at byf at unl.edu. We need to know as much information as we can. That includes where you live please, so I don't have to send you another email. You can also get more information from our social media outlets. That's Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Pinterest. Jody, it, they're lined up so beautifully. What is that? Okay, so it's, it's a parade of terrible leaves. <laughs> so I didn't know what to bring because it's all bugs, right? Mm -hmm. All bugs. So I brought kind of evidence. So when you look at your plant or tree or anything and you're like, there's something wrong here, um, I had a professor that would say, is this normal? And a lot of times it's not, and you have to find out why, and then it will lead to clues to what it is. So, you know, a lot of times I get a picture or a sample, but as Kim says, we need to know where you're from and what the plant is, what is feeding the host plant. So some of these are um, linden, but if you look at this one, it's got like it's kind of tissue papery. And if you hold it up to the light, oh, sorry. I'm really bad. You hold up to the light, you can see what we call frass or little uh, poops in there. So there's something in there or something was in there. So it, we call those minors. They could be um, the larva of uh, a fly, a beetle, or a, a different type of insect. But that will give you a clue to what that could be. The next one here, we can see some yellowing and some stippling. Um, and what you want to do there is you, you think that something is sucking the sap out of it. So what you want to do, a lot of times still attached to the plant, but you want to turn it over and look at it. Here, I'll put it down. But sometimes you'll see spider mites, you can see white flies, you can see leaf hoppers. That will be the clue that there is a sap sucker on the bottom. And then we've got things that look like, like this. And this is very characteristic of a, a beetle that we're seeing everywhere right now, especially in the Lincoln area the Japanese beetle. So this beetle has chewing mouth parts and it feeds in this very characteristic way of making things look like a doily. Um, and we call that skeletonization. And that's a little bit different if you see something that's got big chunks out of it like this. Uh, well, so the culprit is actually still attached here. That's a tiny little bagworm. But you can see the way that's been eaten like that. So it's the veins and everything. So that's a caterpillar and it's got chewing mouth parts as well. And then the last one I'm gonna show, we call these shot hole damage. So whenever we say shot hole, it's just a very tiny round hole. Um, you know, in, in bark, it's usually a bark beetle, but in leaves, it's often, um, oh, I just lost my, a flea beetle, sorry. They're really tiny and they jump like fleas. But, so these are just clues to help you try to figure out what your, uh, your pest could be. Excellent, thank you, Jody. So those of you who have those sorts of leaves, now you know. Now you know where to look. All right, Jeff, you're in the turf chair. That's not in the turf chair, turf. but you know, there's lots of different weeds right now. And as we get, you know, as our perennial plants and our turfs are all kind of maturing, we're getting towards the end of our season here a little bit as we get into August. Um, there are some different weeds that do pop up in the turf uh, around campus, uh, I've noticed. And one of those that we see a little bit are is um, uh, common milkweed. So common milkweed, I, you know, it's uh, important to our monarchs and provides kind of all their nutrition from flour to feeding as larvae on there. Am I right on that so far? Yep. Okay, good. <laughs> Just want to check. I probably should ask before we started. But anyway, um, so it's one of these plants that we've, we view as desirable, but it does have a tendency to spread. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and I have it in the verge area at home between the sidewalk and the curb and, and that helps control it. It's kind of gotten into our landscape beds in the past and I've pulled it out of there and it's fairly easy to pull. It has rhizomes, so it does, you have to be persistent. But if you don't want to use any herbicides, uh, it's just something if you kind of keep digging and keep working with it, you'll eventually get it out. But I like to keep it someplace where it doesn't hurt anything. It's, it's happy there. It's full sun, lots of, lots of heat. It likes the temperature. So, perfect, anyway. excellent. Keep it where you want it. Yeah. 
A weed where you want it. Perfect. All right, what do we have, Kyle? Well, have some spots on peppers. Um, started doing some canning this week. We're all excited because the garden is finally producing. But a lot of the leaves have these sunken, kind of straw-colored spots on them with a, with a halo around them. And this is bacterial, this is a bacterial leaf spot of peppers. Um, we do have it on, on a few, quite a few of the leaves here. Um, you can see there is a little bit of water soaking around those margins. That's something that we often talk about with bacterial, um, bacterial pathogens. It almost looks like the leaf has just been laid in water, and so it's just kind of soaked, soaked out from there. But then on the fruit, so on the leaves, it's kind of sunken, straw-colored lesions, but on the fruit, it's almost the, the opposite. So we have some raised, um, kind of straw colored lesions as well. And so hopefully you guys can see this kind of right where my right where my finger is But it almost looks like a small pimple um, is on the is on the fruit there and it is it is slightly raised Luckily um, don't have a whole lot on the fruit right now And so it's not too much of a concern if you would start to see a lot on the fruit Maybe you'd want to start thinking about removing them um, because this disease will continue to spread this time of year and like a lot of our bacterial diseases, we don't have a lot of good chemical controls for them. So we can't, not a lot of fungicides, things like that can be sprayed. So crop rotation and sanitation is going to be one of the biggest things. But this bacterial pathogen can affect tomatoes as well. So you want to make sure that you're rotating to a crop that, or a, a, a plant that's very different from, from peppers say turnips or something like that. That's just very, very different and that shouldn't get the disease. Excellent, thank you, Kyle. All right, John, teensy weensies. Teensy weensy, okay. So uh, a lot of times when we grow stuff in our vegetable garden, they're very large plants. We have big tomatoes, big eggplants, big peppers. And what if you have a small space garden? So earlier this year, I taught a series of classes on container vegetable gardening and uh, had some cultivars of tomatoes and eggplants that are very small. So I found an eggplant where the plant doesn't get any more than two feet tall and these are the fruit that it produces. So this is a fully mature eggplant, <laughs> right? <laughs> so it's sort of bite-sized. So uh, this one is called Patio Baby, uh, and it's an All-America Selections winner. Uh, and so you can just harvest these off of the eggplant, and you take off the, the stem end here, chop it in half, throw it in the oven, roast it, and you can make whatever you want. And then also, uh, this one is a striped variety. This one is Fairy Tail. So uh, that's uh, another teensy weensy uh, eggplant for your garden. And there's all kinds of uh, miniature tomatoes now uh, and all kinds of small things that you can grow in, cont in containers or small gardens. So don't think you have to grow big vegetables. You can get big flavor in a small package. <laughs> Perfect, and if you don't like eggplant, that makes it even better. <laughs> all right. <laughs> so, all right, your first uh, picture question is from Kozad. American elm, about 10 years old, bore damage, and then he found this, he pulled out some frass, and then he found what he thought was a nematode in there. And he, it's cool to have put in a pencil lead. He, uh, he did have one that succumbed to elm bark beetles. He wonders, should he treat this? And that's at the base of the tree. It's a 10-year-old tree. Okay, well, it would depend what the condition of the, the rest of the tree is, if, mm -hmm. if you want to treat for it. But that does look like some type of borer has been in there. There are a lot of different borers that will um, bore into elm. Um, I can't say exactly which one, but there is a, a publication that was written by uh, Fred and Jim Killish, Fred Baxendale and Jim Killish. Um, I think it's insect borers of shady trees and woody ornamentals. So you can look that up. But this that you pulled out with the frass does not look like a borer. Um, you did mention nematode and you're, you're on the right track. It does look similar to a, a fungus gnat larvae and they would take advantage of that, that rotting wood. They, they feed on decaying organic matter. So um, that's probably what that is, not necessarily related to um, the wood or the, the tree but I would definitely evaluate the tree to find out if it's worth treating. All right, and then you have another one that is a tree question, that is what is happening to the cottonwood? Okay. So the base is probably a bore damage. Yeah, again. it's a bore, and um, knowing that is cottonwood, we do have the cottonwood bore, which is a fantastic, beautiful, giant beetle. It's mm -hmm. not something you would want to fly into your head while you're biking, one of those, like it's big. <laughs> but um, 
that's what that could be, but usually they do not uh, warrant control. Um, they just come out every now and then, but I would also evaluate the tree, the rest of the tree, to make sure it's healthy. All right, thanks, Jody. This is a really interesting one oh. for turf. Oh, yeah, there, there it is coming out, so you can see the larvae on that one. Yeah. Pretty, okay, so yeah. this is finally um, the iris borer. Oh, yeah, that is so, the iris So, yeah, because it's yeah. got that pinkish color and it's yeah. super big grub. Yeah. Um, so you may be seeing some symptoms on the plant uh, to lead you down to that rhizome. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if there's other issues in that rhizome, but if you want to get rid of those, um, pull those up, pull up the leaves, and anything that was infected to make sure you're getting rid of the eggs so that next year they're, they're away from your iris bed. Um, so sanitation in the garden. And then if you do want to treat, you're going to want to treat um, before the, you know, when the eggs are, are hatching. So it's going to be early in the spring. All right, thanks, Jody. All right, Jeff, this is really interesting. It's using radishes and cover cropping for an urban lawn. Okay. And so, um, you know, it's enhancing his yard, but what he's discovered is the daikon forage radishes are popping up like this in his turf. So he, he'd like to improve the yard using biologicals rather than mechanical. Is this going to be kind of a long term solution, or what do we think here? So. So I guess the question is, he doesn't want the radishes growing in his yard. Well, he wants to improve the soil, but he's not necessarily happy with the radishes. Okay. <laughs> well, you know, I, as far as the radishes or anything that's left over from some sort of cover crop, I, you know, depending on, we see three here, so, you know, it would be easily dug to remove those. And, and certainly, you know, I would recommend if he's making his own, his own compost, you know, once that compost is prepared, using that on the lawn. And that, that seems to work pretty well. And even, you know, sometimes with our home compost, it doesn't maybe get to the correct temperature. We may have some weed seeds. Um, but for me, we've, we use that on campus and we might get some weed seed germinating, but it's really not a problem. And it's, if you're doing somewhat regular mowing, it should take care of an awful lot of that stuff as well without having to use herbicides. So All right. I think that that sort of thing may be kind yes. of on track and keep you in the right direction. All right, perfect. Okay, Kyle, your first one is 40 year old lilac shrubs. Looked fine this spring, bloom, now they look terrible. Um, some are along a gravel road, one's on the north side of the house. So what, what did we think here? Yeah. Um, I and I think we have a picture of the foliage mm -hmm. too. Yeah. Um, yeah, so anytime you just see that massive death or, um, or the, the entire plant is declining like that, really start to think about it's either something environmental, so pretty big, or down down below with the roots. Um, seeing these sort of foliar symptoms looks a lot like um, just scorch, and so some sort of some sort of environmental heat damage um, or drought stress could be another one. We've had a lot of moisture in this state, but there's also a lot of areas that are quite dry, and so depending on this exact location, it, it could be really dry. Another thing that I've seen a lot of this year has been uh, fertilizer burn, and so people have been applying a little bit too much fertilizer, and then they go ahead and water it, and that ends up burning, um, really burning the, the foliage and can, can end up causing that pretty, um, pretty severe decline as well. So unfortunately, not, not a whole lot to do about it. Um, I would uh, you know, make sure that you are giving it plenty of water going into, the, going into the fall here, and then make sure that you are doing some pruning as well. The 40-year-old lilac, there's gonna be a lot of other issues potentially, some bores, things like that. So just go ahead and prune out about a third of that foliage this year, hope the next year it comes back looking much better. All right, and your next one is actually a Vanderwolf pine, Nebraska City location so okay um <laughs> so yeah nebraska city has had a mm -hmm. a lot of water this year mm -hmm. um, a lot of moisture and i think that this is environmental as well and so it really looks like kind of the entire top portion of that of that plant has all completely dead branches and all the all the <clears throat> all the um all the needles are completely brown too Lower branches look perfectly fine, and so would start to think maybe winter kill or some sort of injury like that. But when I was zooming in on this picture, I could see that kind of right at that transition zone between the green needles and the brown needles, the bark looked misshapen and looked like there were some larger cracks and things like that. So now we start thinking maybe there's some sort of canker um, or there even could be some animal feeding as well that's going on down there. 
And if it is a canker, not a whole lot that you can do about it. Um, fungicide control for cankers is really difficult um, to get the timing straight, so pruning is really going to be your best bet for that. All right, thanks, Kyle. <clears throat> All right, this one came down to us from Atkinson. And what is that, John? <laughs> Not so the doily, the, the right, tomato yes. that's... <laughs> lovely, that's lovely crochet work there. Uh -huh. um, so um, this is a phenomenon called vivipary, which is very interesting. So vivipary is live birth. So like in animals, we would say, you know, something that gives birth, it's live birth. Well, tomatoes and sometimes other fruits can do this in certain conditions. So some tomatoes um, are more likely to do this than others. So basically something has happened to break the dormancy of the seeds. So it's a, it's a hormonal shift in the tomato, like the, it doesn't get the right hormone signals, it's called abscisic acid, uh, that gives it the, the signal to break that dormancy. Uh, so that could be something, it's like a genetic thing going on, or it could be if you had stored it, like if you've stored it in cold, that sort of breaks the, the dormancy of the seeds and when you bring it out to the warm and you set it out, that happens. Um, it happens in other things, like I've had it where I've bought maybe like a butternut squash and it sat on the counter for a few weeks and when I crack it open, all the seeds have germinated mm -hmm. because it was stored too cold at the grocery store. So um, it's a very interesting phenomenon, it's very fun. Do, 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 do. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, sort of like, you know, it looks really weird. Yeah. Um, you know, probably not a choice edible, you know. Right. Just <laughs> <clears throat> well, perhaps you've seen a few videos online where trimming a tree has gone horribly wrong. It only proves the point that hiring a professional to do the tough jobs with your trees is always going to be the safest choice. We talked to Eric North about how to choose the right arborist for your situation. So the general idea behind hiring an arborist, a professional arborist, is that it's a highly skilled profession, actually. We don't think of it that way because anybody can buy a chainsaw, but really the climbing in the tree using a gear like what I'm wearing, what you can maybe see in the background, takes a lot of expertise and skill and training. So if you're looking at pruning your tree and you want to maybe do it yourself, my general rule of thumb is if you need to do anything above your head and you need to involve a chainsaw, you should hire a professional unless you've been professionally trained in how to use that equipment. There's a lot of fatalities and a lot of very serious injuries that can happen when homeowners try to do things like uh, tree trimming and pruning above their head on their own, including ladders. People don't think about it, but a lot of the injuries come from falling off ladders or just not really understanding. They can cut a branch and don't understand how that branch might swing or fall. And so the biggest risk is danger to yourself the secondary risk is not knowing and understanding how the tree biology works, and so you might actually cause more damage to the tree by trying to do the work yourself. So if it's anything bigger than small branches or anything above your head, it's really best to call a professional. So particularly if you're looking at things that happen after storms where there's lots of tree damage, the biggest thing to do is, again, if it's above the ground, you really want to call a professional arborist. People don't understand that when branches are broken, it's not like a two by four. There's a lot of tension and there's a lot of physics involved in how that branch might twist and break. And we've seen really horrible accidents when homeowners try to stand on a branch and cut it themselves and not understanding how that tree will go. We've seen people thrown in the air from a branch as pressure is released. And so a trained certified arborist is really going to know how to assess that situation and remove that damaged debris or remove that tree or just prune that tree in a way that's safest for both the homeowner themselves and the best biology for the tree. So when it comes time to actually pick an arborist or call because you decide you need some tree work done, whether it's tree removal or whether it's pruning of branches, first things you want to do is look uh, to your city and see if there's a list, if some cities maintain a list of who's licensed to do work in that particular city. The other thing you want to do is look to make sure that they're certified arborist. In Nebraska, you can either be a Nebraska certified arborist or you can be an International Society of Arboriculture certified arborist. You can be both. And having at least one or multiple of those certification tells us that the arborist has gone through at least some, some of the basic trainings and understands the biology of the tree. You also want to make sure that they're licensed and insured in their community and in that community so that if an accident does happen, it's not going to, uh, the homeowner will be covered in that case. 
So basically what it comes down to is if you look at a tree and you have to get off the ground or you have to use uh, any special equipment like chainsaws, you want to hire an arborist, particularly after storms where there's different forces at play and it can be very, very dangerous to do even removal of the debris. And so hiring a professional that's trained, certified, licensed, insured, and has experience to remove that is really an important feature. Trimming a few branches, doing a little bit of light pruning on those young trees is one thing. Keep your feet on the ground, the chainsaw below your head, and leave the big stuff to the professionals. Don't fall out of the tree. All right, so Jody, you have something going on with the burning bush. Uh, very mature. They're showing these fabulous symptoms. And what is mm -hmm. this, and what do we do? Uh, this is happening a lot because hot, dry conditions will give rise to a spider mite problem. Mm -hmm. And even if you don't see them, you'll see that, that evidence. And if you touch the leaf, some of them will just fall right off onto the ground. But if you look underneath, sometimes you'll, if you look really closely, you'll see the, the mites moving. They're light colored with a couple dark spots. Um, what you want to do is like spray it with water every now and then to cool it down. Um, Jeff says it's gonna be back fine next year, so just print it like normal. <laughs> and next year, scout by putting a piece of paper underneath and tapping it, and then when the spider mites show up, not as bad as this, you can take care of it with horticultural oil or insecticidal soap, so you can get it earlier before it looks really bad. All right, thanks. And your next set here is an acreage between Davy and Raymond. Uh, two swamp white oaks, three inch caliper, they've been healthy, but they've got these spots and then they peeled the spot off and they found a little caterpillar in there. So, the, I mean, it's a great set of pictures. Yeah, that's like what I do in my free time. <laughs> <laughs> so that's really cool. So these are, or shouldn't be any damage to the oak tree. Uh, they are solitary oak miners. Um, and so in there, in that one picture with that larvae, that is going to turn into a moth. Mm -hmm. um, you can see the little frass in there. So that's a little caterpillar. They don't really do anything um, to the oak. Should be fine, no treatment necessary. All right, awesome. Okay, Jeff, um, we have a couple that are weeds, since okay. you're in the chair instead of Bill, since okay. Bill really doesn't do <laughs> weeds. Uh, the first here is Omaha. What is this lawn weed, long root? It's, it's taking a, over the lawn. Yeah, it's a shepherd's purse, so it's a brassica. Um, and um, it's fairly easy controlled uh, earlier in the year, but it's also a winter annual. So it's something we'd want to be looking at applying a pre-emergent here very soon, mm -hmm. uh, really any time now to do to help with our winter annuals. Um, you know, depending on how many you have, I would be tempted to pull as much as I can. They produce a lot of seed. So as much, if you could remove the plants, that would be ideal. All right, and your next one is an image that has a plantain in it but they want to kill the plantain, but keep the clover. Right. You know, that's awfully tough. Um, you know, ideally you would do hand digging, um, quite honestly. You could do some spot spraying with a glyphosate um, and be very careful. But I think that uh, depending on how much you have, I would, I would start off with the hand digging. You know, what I, what I try to do with myself with some of that stuff is I give myself a certain amount of time, 10 minutes. How many weeds can I pull in 10 minutes? It's amazing how many weeds you can pull in 10 <laughs> minutes. You know, put in your, your uh, headset and listen to your favorite songs and, uh, and time would fly and you'll have it all pulled. So. All right, perfect, I you, like that. You so. go back the next day and try to beat that. So. It's, yeah, you're right, it's kind of competitive. <laughs> yes, you're right, yeah, right. Your own lightning round. Yeah, that's right. Going. Maybe we should have a competition at my house. Okay. <laughs> okay. Bring all your friends. <laughs> yeah. right. We yeah. do that with Japanese beetles. Do you? Except <laughs> I don't do the, the picking, I get my daughter to do it. Perfect. <laughs> all right, Kyle, uh, tomatoes, and this is actually a student at UNL okay. that needs some advice here. Raised bed garden four years ago, lots of trouble with plants this year. Um, she doesn't really say whether they rotate their crop, but she's got three pictures of this particular set of tomatoes. And then your next viewer also has one that the blossoms are falling off and the things are turning yellow, so. Okay, well for these, for these first ones, I think we have a, a few different issues going on. And so the, the foliage um, that we were looking at, I think that is, that's early blight of tomatoes. If you look closely at the, at the lesions on the leaves, you see these nice kind of concentric rings, and that is one of the diagnostic features of, of early blight. 
Um, and that's so crop rotation, really important for, um, for controlling early blight. Again, you know, something very different than tomatoes, like turnips. I'm trying to get turnips <laughs> in my garden. Next year, my wife doesn't like them, but <laughs> I'm, if I say it enough, maybe she'll, I'll convince her. Um, or leave you. Or leave me, that's, that's another option. But um, so uh, rotation um, uh, works very well for this, but if you're unable to rotate, there are some uh, chemicals that can be used. So boscolid, um, as is found in Endura, um, works fairly well for it. Otherwise, there are some copper products that can be used too. Now the fruit um, had kind of some of these sunken lesions on it, that these black sunken lesions, and I'm guessing that is anthracnose. And that's primarily due to just the moisture that we've had in Lincoln this year. Um, see anthracnose quite a bit. If you're only seeing that amount of injury, I wouldn't worry too much about it. However, if you are seeing a lot, um, then you can, again, think of, um, look, at, look to some of those products that I had mentioned earlier for this. Okay, and is that other one also early blight? You think that? Um, this one, I'm, I'm really not sure. Would probably need a better, um, either a sam physical sample or a better picture. Early blight can, um, it can cause the um, lesions on the stem and the branch that can coalesce and kind of form a canker that can kill the branch. So it's possible that that's early blight, but I, I really can't say for sure without something more concrete. All right, they did dust with seven for inchworms. Mm. Well, I, I don't think the seven's gonna do a whole lot for early blight, unfortunately. You don't think, I, I you don't don't think, think so. so. <laughs> I will go out on a limb there. But. All right, all right, thanks. All right, hydrangeas. Oh, yes. We have two different viewers. Uh, first is in Omaha, 10 feet long and six feet wide. This is Annabelle, and then this is what it kind of looks like, but then she has the second picture here, which is, it's kind of beginning to do this a little. And then your next viewer, uh, hers, um, these next two is a potted hydrangea. So first an oldest and then a newer bloom that looks like it's gonna be the same. So what do we think is going on here? So what happens sometimes, especially with these newer cultivars, is the way that they, they breed them, the flower parts uh, that are responsible for reproduction are turned into petals and they are, they're, they are made very attractive that way. But sometimes we get a, sort of a genetic reversion and it goes back to the old flower forms. And I think that's what's happening. Uh, we just call it um, reversion, where it's going back to the fertile type of flowers rather than the showy type of flowers. And that happens a lot with newer, newer cultivars. Sometimes we'll get those weird questions too, like my red flower turned back to yellow that's a reversion as well. So that sometimes happens. Mm -hmm. And you can't fix it. You, get you to can't start fix over. it. You have, you have a new plant. It's you like do. a, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> that doesn't look like your old one, yes. which is really unfortunate. <laughs> so, all right, as our vegetables continue to ripen for harvest, we're going to turn our attention to a gorgeous annual out here at our garden. Here's Terry James to show us a beautiful petunia in the backyard farmer garden. This week on the Backyard Farmer Garden, we're gonna start looking at some of the All-America Selection winners for 2019 that have looked really good. The first one we're gonna look at is the Petunia Wave Series. This one's called Petunia Wave Carmine Velour. Kind of a red with kind of a purple throat knockout. All the judges say that it's my favorite, outstanding, it doesn't fade, it's vibrant. Takes full sun to part sun, uh, it will take pretty dry conditions here in Lincoln. We haven't had to give it a lot of extra supplemental water since we haven't seen those rains like some parts of the state have. It is trailing, so it will kind of fall over into a landscape bed or a container. It gets to be about six to eight inches tall and it will bloom till frost. It'll take one of those first light frost and then it'll go away. Uh, the color's solid and the bloom is pretty big, so it's about two inches. You can put it this in a container, you can put it into your landscape bed, so it's a pretty versatile plant to use throughout the landscape. So check it out. Uh, should be in your seed catalogs. It started from seed. Petunia Wave Carmine Velour. Stop by the Backyard Farmer Garden and check it out. And if you want to check out that petunia, you're going to have to go a little further north along the greenhouses and it's in a raised bed against the sidewalk, and it's worth the trip. 
I'm ready. Probably not me. And you're winning? I'm winning. Okay. John. I want to have a three-way tie like the last time I was on here. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> right. How do you move a bleeding heart and when? You want to move it when it's dormant. So either late in the fall or early in the spring before it comes out. And you want to just dig it up and move it. All right. This is a rural Craig uh, viewer who wants to know whether he should pull his onions because the tops are drooping to keep them from rotting. Yeah, once the, the tops start to, to die back, that's when you pull them out and you can dry them and store them. You want to dry them first. All right. How and when do you trim inkberry? This is a Bellevue viewer. So you want to do that in uh, spring because that's a broadleaf evergreen. Mm -hmm. All right. Will 2,4-D on violets under a grape arbor damage the grapes? It will kill or damage any broadleaf that it touches, so yes. All right. This viewer uh, topped an apple tree and now only has water sprouts on it. Will it ever produce fruit? You have to retrain it, so don't ever top a tree like that. Uh, take out the water sprouts and find a new leader and new side branches. All right. This is a central city viewer who wants to know when to prune roses. You want to do that in uh, early spring, late winter before the, they leaf out. All right. Nice job. You ready? Born ready. Take your time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This is a Lexington viewer who wants to know what is the address for your clinic? 1875 North West North 38th Street, oh. <laughs> Plant Science Hall, Lincoln, Nebraska. Or just call 402-472-2559. All right. We have uh, three viewers who have ornamental pears that have orange spots. What is it, and is there a cure? It's rust. Um, nothing, not a whole lot you can do about it now. You can treat for that in the spring, right as those blossoms are beginning to open. All right. We have a viewer who wants to know whether roses will ever recover from black spot. Uh, they will eventually, um, but it may take, a, may take a little while. All right. What are the correct fusarium wilt products for tomatoes? Fusarium wilt is difficult as it's a soil-borne pathogen, and so um, there are some. Uh, chlorothan chlorothalonil is one of the products that would work, but anytime you have a soil-borne vascular rot like that, it's going to be tough to control. All right. This is a viewer who has the broadleaf euonymus, and he says it looks like it has fungus on the climbing stems. What is that? Um, it could be a lot of things. Uh, if it's white, powdery and mildew. If it's black, I would say something else. All right. And if it is brown? If it's brown. It, the roots. Oh, the roots are brown. Oh, then <laughs> most uh, phytophthora. <laughs> All right, Jeff, are you ready? I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> what is the seed mix you use on campus for turf? We use a, um, a fine leaf fescue mix. So, and it varies year to year depending on where our, our source is. But so it's a variety of fine leaf fescues and typically we'll have maybe somewhere up to about 10% of a, of a perennial rye in there well, as well to help kind of sprout a little bit quicker, so. All right, uh, do you need to strip the soil along the edges of a sidewalk that have been salt damaged before you seed in the fall? You might wanna consider it, um, especially after the last few winters, uh, the soil or the amount of salt building up in the soil is creating issues with uh, seed germination. So I think it's probably um, a, a good situation to go ahead and remove that soil. All right, what is the worst lawn weed that you deal with? The worst lawn weed that I deal with. Lightning round. <laughs> <laughs> Take your time. Uh, Take your time. Uh, bindweed. <laughs> Field bindweed. Field bindweed is one of those things that you see it in the turf and the shrubs and everything. So. I just want to be yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to give thoughtful <laughs> answers. You know. That seems to be one of the themes of the turf chair. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Jody, are you yeah. ready? All right, this is an Omaha viewer who wants to put their house on the market, but wants to know when the cicada killers will disappear. Oh, well, I mean, September's a good time. <laughs> All right. <laughs> this is an Underwood, Iowa viewer who wonders whether they can put a systemic around the base of their trees for Japanese beetles. Uh, not right now, and not Linden. All right, so spring? Yeah, spring you can. Midichlorbrid. All right. Okay. So we have a viewer who says there are teensy weensy little box elder bugs all over the soil. Should they be treated to control them or just ignore? Um, I would just ignore them. All right. They're just in the soil. 
We have a viewer who wants to know uh, whether the milkweed that she has that is covered with aphids will still be utilized by the monarchs. Yes, it will. All right. Omaha viewer, will Japanese beetles eat plums? Probably the leaves. Not the fruit? Probably if it can get into the fruit, it yeah. will. All right. I mean, I don't, I, it, it will eat a lot. Of <laughs> <laughs> I wonder who won. Oh, way to go. Uh, Good job. <laughs> and plan of the week, John. So. Oh, yeah. Oh, I got so tied up in there there I forgot. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have the plants of the week. Uh, and uh, the one thing I wanted to point out a few weeks ago, I was here and I brought some uh, Malabar spinach. This is still the same plant. It's just been hanging out in, in the that vase. vase. Wow. Yeah, so it's so uh, uh, Kim has kept it alive all these weeks and we'll just keep bringing it back as long as it's alive. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a great little plant. So we also have a uh, compass plant. It's a native, uh, you can see it's uh, a sunflower. So it's a, a nice uh, pollinator prairie plant there. And then you'll notice these things. Those are some very big hips, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? And so this is a pine scented rose uh, and it has fragrant single pink flowers. Uh, and uh, if you're wanting a, an edible rose, you wanna look for a rose with big hips. And here you go. So there you go, this, uh, those edible hips. So they have more vitamin C per weight than oranges. Yeah, and that's actually uh, not a real pretty rose in flower. I mean, it's a single pink, but mm -hmm. who yeah. cares? Yeah, but yeah. The, 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 the hips are, are probably better than the flowers. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Yep. All right, thank you, John. Mm -hmm. All right, pictures, Jody. Okay. So this is a rural Beatrice viewer found this beetle on her tomato plants. She wonders what it is and what are her treatment options. Um, it's an ash gray blister beetle shaped like an exclamation point. If, if you're seeing just that one, I would just pick it off and put it in soapy water. They usually come in clusters though, so put a glove on though because they do have um, the ability to cause blisters. All right, and then your next uh, couple here, this is in Logan County dying pumpkin plant. So she sent us, I think, a couple different pictures here of, of this death going on and you can kind of see the stem damage. Okay, so if, it, if there's stem damage and you see some orange oozy frass coming out, it's the squash vine borer. And uh, I would, it might be too late for that particular plant. You would wanna pull those and kind of concentrate on the ones that are good or the vines that are good. But uh, they, many of them could be in there boring away. Right, yep, all right, unfortunate for the pumpkin crop. Yeah. All right, so Jeff, uh, your first picture here is a bunch of different weeds in a buffalo grass lawn. Okay. Um, particularly crabgrass and dandelions is what this viewer said, and they wonder control and management, especially this time of year. Right, you know, it's kind of tough. I, with the dandelions, um, as things, with buffalo grass, as things cool, uh, you may be able to use um, a broadleaf herbicide to, to go in and spot treat the, the dandelions. Uh, so you could do a little bit, a little of that. You know, at this stage, I would keep it mowed, maybe at three inches, four inches, something like that, so we don't allow any more seed development. And then look at, again, putting down some pre-emergent here in the next few weeks, and then again in the spring, and see if we can kind of get that controlled that way. But buffalo grass is so susceptible to herbicide damage. Um, it's one of those that we kind of lean against using a lot of uh, post-emergent herbicides on, on buffalo grass. All right, and speaking of herbicide damage, your next picture, this is a viewer uh, 12 miles north of Mullen in the Sand Hills. Mm -hmm. uh, they had a small patch of ragweed along the gravel road. This year it's totally lined with what they're calling variegated ragweed. An ornamental ragweed. An ornamental ragweed, <laughs> yeah. Surrounded by native pastures, they say it's never been sprayed. Well, with the soils out there, it's likely a nutritional issue. Um, so I, I would say that's probably the, the, the problem there. And I, you know, again, this is another one that if you don't want to use herbicides, either we're pulling or mowing, getting in there with the shredder and getting that knocked down. So we see if we can kind of stop that cycle. All right, and we don't want a very good right. ragweed yeah, on the right. market. That's right. <laughs> yeah. All right, so um, you have Il Veronica, and it's not a woman, it's a plant. Oh. <laughs> this is a papillion viewer. They have a butterfly garden. They have a lot of these different Veronicas along the edge. 
They're saying a single one is stunted. You can see it in the middle and in a follow-up they said that it's actually kind of seeming to go to the ones next to it. Okay. Um, yeah, so I do think that this could potentially be aster yellows, especially if it is starting to spread onto, onto some of the other ones. And so aster yellows, is a, it's a phytoplasma, so it's a bacteria that kind of behaves like a virus. But it's actually, it's uh, vectored by leafhoppers. And so when you want to, or you're thinking about controlling for aster yellows, it's going to be a lot of leafhopper control. Other nice thing is that you can just go in and prune out those infected, um, infected stems as well. That, that works pretty well. All right, thank you, Kyle. All right, John, I know you're a vegetable guy, but you've got a couple tree questions. Joy. Joy, uh, and they're not edible. <laughs> <laughs> the first one is actually, uh, this is a cottonwood, and he did send a question uh, in construction process earlier, so we answered this earlier. Three feet of sand was mm -hmm. built up around this cottonwood. So this is the follow-up, and he is wondering, is this a former cottonwood? So uh, with the, the sand, so that can actually cause some damage by smothering out the roots. Um, but also what could happen is, you know, it was a construction zone, and actually putting that sand in or removing that sand or any other equipment that was in the area could run over the root zone and damage the roots by smashing them with weight. So I think that's what has happened. So I think that is going to be a former tree. All right, and your next one is actually an Omaha viewer. Um, they had a lot of work done with water mains. So this is uh, workers that were in that area on this linden. What do we think here? So that is, you know, some pretty good damage there. Um, it can be difficult, you know, especially in the early stages, you wanna see if there was any underlying damage there. If it's just the bark, you could, you know, have it heal over and, uh, but it's, it's uh, sort of like a 50-50 chance, I think. It, I think it could go. I would, I would err on the, the side of caution there. Yeah, and maybe the twisting motion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if there was a lot of really... twisting, other than just the bark damage, right. I would say right. it's gone. All right, thanks, John. Well, you know, Backyard Farmer has visited Lauritz and Gardens several times over the past few years. Every time we return, we are amazed at all the beautiful gardens and that biodiversity. Jim Locklear is the Director of Conservation, and he takes a few minutes to show us the parking lot of all places and tell us why that is really a neat innovation. Well, welcome to Lauritz and Gardens. I'm here today to talk about, of all things, our parking lot. Uh, Lauritz and Gardens is 100 acres of, in the riverfront hills here near downtown Omaha. And within the 100 acres, we have about 20 different garden spaces. And part of what we're, we do here at Lauritz and Gardens is we not only have beautiful botanical displays, but we also think about the place as a natural area. It's an urban oasis within uh, the city of Omaha. So part of what we're trying to do here is understand the biology of the place. We've got, uh, we're doing bird and butterfly and bee surveys so that we might manage the garden uh, for the benefit of pollinators and wildlife. And one of the most remarkable things we found out is that some of the highest levels of biodiversity is right here in our parking lot. But uh, it doesn't take too long to understand why that might be the case. This is, uh, the parking lot was designed, first of all, to screen cars. We have about 600 parking spaces here but you wouldn't know it because we have lots of plantings of uh, vegetation strips throughout the, the parking area. Um, but in addition, the, the parking lot is also designed to catch and filter rainwater as it comes off. And so water flows into a series of ponds that are filled with vegetation that helps cleanse the water as it comes off. But the strips of vegetation planted throughout this area feature native plants. We have bur oak and sumac and redbud, a lot of native woodies, plus prairie wildflowers, uh, and grasses, and so we just there's a lot of variety of, of plant material in here, and it it's nice because it creates a, a Midwest sense of place, which we appreciate, but it also provides uh, incredible habitat for wildlife. And and if you know about uh, wildlife management, greater diversity around edges, so we have a lot of edges here, uh, and we have water, and we have stonework, and all the kinds of things that that benefit a variety of wildlife. So. There are some uh, birds, for instance, that we almost only see out here in the parking garden. And we have certain butterflies that uh, we've only found out here in the parking lot. So it, it goes to show that you could take a space that maybe is just sort of 
uh, just has some basic work to do for you in, in the landscape. But if you're creative and, and you plant it in, a, in an intentional way, uh, you can, can create welcoming habitat for people as well as, as for wildlife. And we don't use strictly natives here. Uh, we have lots of non-native things that are, are great pollinator plants as well. So it's, it's a nice mix, but, and it also has to be beautiful because we're a botanical garden. So we try and have a uh, multi-season of interest here in terms of things that bloom in the spring all the way to things that have wonderful fall color. Uh, so we do want you to go into the visitor center and into the, the 100 acres and enjoy the rest of the garden. But uh, this is a place where you can also, uh, if you keep your eyes open, you can discover some really wonderful aspects of, of uh, Nebraska and uh, our, our native wildlife. So it really is neat to see what Lauritsen does both to conserve water, put on that perfect show 363 days of a year. <laughs> two days they're closed, <laughs> two whole days. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, Jody, you have one, two, three, at least, A, B, C, D, let's identify these things. Okay. So the first one is a Malcolm viewer. Are they monarch caterpillars on her milkweed? No, these are milkweed tussock moth caterpillars and they feed in this cluster like this for the first couple instars. And these, the second one is, ooh. this is Clarkson. Yeah, so these are the, um, the checker spot butterfly caterpillars. Is this like a coneflower or sunflower? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, so the, so the first one, I mean, they look so similar. The first one feeds on milkweed and this one feeds on everything else. Um, no, it's usually the, the sunflowers, but the, the thing in common is they, they feed in this large cluster and they make the leaves look pretty bad. Mm -hmm. um, but you like them. The butterflies I like, the tussock moth caterpillars I think are cute. They're like little shih tzus. They're so cute. <laughs> if they were a puppy, that's what they would be. <laughs> All right, then your next one is east of Council Bluffs. And she found these on a cosmos and she wonders what they are and how does she get rid of them and keep them from spreading around. Okay, so those are aphids. And a lot of times there are specialized aphids for different plants. So um, they probably won't infest other plants, but if you can find that right like spray stream of water, which I finally found on, on my aphids at home, you can spray them off and um, keep them away from the other plants. And you might have to do that, you know, every week or two, but. All right, and your final one for ID is, this is real western Oto County feeding on the milkweed pods. Hey, they're a little bit smaller than, than the ones we have here, but we have uh, large milkweed bugs and they feed on the seeds of the pods. And um, when they get bigger, uh, they will have wings and you'll see a black band go right across. Um, they don't usually do enough harm. They don't destroy the milkweed. Still plenty for the monarchs. All right, perfect, thanks. Okay, this is, uh, this is sort of a recurring question. Okay. And it is trying to figure out whether this particular turf is nimble will. So we have a couple different pictures here. This is West Omaha, so I think the first one, and then she sent a little closer picture. Yeah, and I think that's what it, that's what it looks like to me as well. That was my first thought when I saw mm -hmm. it as nimble will. And so as far as controlling it, you know, there's a couple of things you can do depending on the size of the patch. Um, you know, the first thing would be if you have some just isolated spots, you can dig it up and that works pretty well and just make sure you, you take a little bit of the bluegrass or fescue that's growing around to take that out. But about six inches down, you should be able to control it fairly well that way. You can spot spray it with Roundup or Tenacity, either one. Uh, and this is really a pretty good time of year to do that, but it's gonna be, you're gonna have to be persistent. It may take two, three, four applications. So it's a warm season grass. I know it has a tendency to sneak up on folks. Mm -hmm. We don't see it early in the year, and all of a sudden in June, we're wondering what this is, and by July, it's really going. So, mm -hmm. so anyway, you have to be kind of persistent with it. And you can actually see it best in the winter when it's big old brown patches right. yeah, in your that's yard. Right. That's right. Yeah. yeah, all right, thanks, Jeff. Okay, this is a Bradshaw viewer, Kyle, uh, wonders what these are and is there any way to control these? They come up by the dozens and when they rot, they turn black and messy. Okay, and I think they also come up under his ash tree every year and that's really the, the key feature there. Um, and so that is an ash bolete. Um, it's a, 
It actually has an association with, uh, with an ash aphid. And so uh, the mushroom grows, it feeds on the honeydew that the aphid produces, and then actually forms kind of a sclerotia or a hard, um, a hard case around the aphid as the aphid is maturing. And I really appreciate this photo because they, they had split, the, split one of the mushrooms as well, and it has that nice blue color, and that is very typical of the ash bolete too. And it's a mushroom, everybody wants to know, can I eat it? And this one, if it's dried, it might be okay. Um, has kind of a nutty flavor, but when they're fresh, they just get mucusy and not the best when you cook them. In other words, don't. No. I would avoid it. <laughs> right. You know, and I always tell people that all mushrooms are edible. Some are just edible once. 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 Yep. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> all right, so your second one actually is, um, what is this? And, and they did say um, it, it was in a raised bed after they added some new soil, and then it did this, and the, the vegetables didn't like it very well. It uh, looks to me like slime mold mm -hmm. is going to be my guess. Um, the moisture, recent moisture, it's going to pop up and kind of be showy for a couple of days until it dries and then it just kind of becomes a powder and will disappear until there's more moisture. Um, as far as it hurting your vegetables, it really shouldn't, so I would think there maybe there's something else going on. All right, thanks, Kyle. All right, so this is a beautiful picture, actually, mm -hmm. John. Uh, it's a Beatrice viewer. And she calls these tree lilies because they're obviously quite tall, uh, four years old, some are three years old. She wants to know when and how to divide, but can you take off the bulbs from the side? Uh, so they are bulbs, so they are actually very easily propagatable. <laughs> so you can actually uh, take those side bulbs off the side plants and move those. Uh, you can dig them up every once in a while and separate them out. They're um, um, scale-like bulbs, so you can easily separate those. Uh, and what you want to do is wait until they have died back in the fall. Uh, you don't want to do them while they're actively growing. Uh, you want to wait so that then they've stored all of their energy in those bulbs for the next year. That's where you're going to get all of your growth and your flowering and, and all of that for the next year. So you want to do that uh, in the fall uh, or, you know, you could go out before they come up next year, but then you've forgotten where they are and, you know, it's died back. But, yeah, you can easily dig up those and transplant them and propagate them very easily. All right, excellent. Thanks, John. Well, of course, we always have announcements of fun things going on in the gardening world. And I think our first announcement, of course, is our Grow Row produce donations. Still taking those Tuesdays from 5 to 7 in the Backyard Farmer Garden, and it's a good reason to visit the garden as well. And our totals this year for Produce for the Heart donations, 789 pounds from the Backyard Farmer Garden, and our Grow Row is 325 pounds. So we're feeding a lot of people with that. I think our third one, maybe, if we have one, is... We are going to be at State Fair, as always, Monday, August 26th, so it's a new day, Q&A, 2.30, 3.30, taping is 4 to 5 at the Raising Nebraska building. The building's still standing, the landscape's a little sketchy after that terrible mm -hmm. storm they had out there. So we expect you to come, and of course, then we also have Digging Deeper with Backyard Farmer. You can watch us on Facebook, Sundays at 6.30 p.m. Central Time. You can follow that on Backyard Farmer and uh, NET Nebraska Facebook pages. Good one this week because we have Chris Helzer from the Nature Conservancy, and we also have uh, Jim Locklear from Lauritsen. All right, so we have just a little time for a question. This is a viewer north of Columbus, and she had hundreds of these little butterflies, and they were brown, little with their wings kind of like this with a white spot on the wing. Um, sounds like a silver spotted skipper. Mm -hmm. They and fly all erratically, and they're, they're nice. They're one of the bigger of the skippers. And, and does the larva like damage a bunch of stuff or no? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it does. We've had a lot of farmers getting kind of mad. Yeah, so. yeah, mm -hmm. soybeans and everything yeah. else. Yeah, all right. This is a how in the world do you, I, do you uh, get rid of rush, and it is scouring rush, mm -hmm. so it's the horsetail thing. Right. Well, it's going to be resistant to a lot of herbicides. Mm -hmm. um, there's some specialty products um, you may be able to, to use. I would suggest really digging. Um, it's probably going to be your best bet. Um, I, again, I think some of the herbicides you'd have to use would be probably... Um, difficult to get and inexpensive, so.